this whole service has been about the power in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to give you another title for it. Actually, at the top of my page, it says Power in the Name of Jesus. But then I've got another name for it underneath that. And I'm going to call this Calling on the Name. Would you open your Bibles? And we're going to talk about calling on the name. And so we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 2. <clears throat> to the church of God in Corinth. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy. Together with all those everywhere who call on the name of, the Lord Jesus, of our Lord Jesus Christ. Their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says this letter wasn't just for the church at Corinth, but it was for, for everyone, everywhere, who calls upon the name of the Lord. So some people ask us, what denomination are we? And we say, well, we're not a denomination. Most of us have come from some denomination. Uh, I did. Uh, the people in the early church were first called the people of the way because they had found a new and living way into the presence of the Lord, not through the curtain that only the priest, the high priest could go through, and only one day a year, but they were called the people of the way because the curtain in the temple was torn in two when Jesus died, and through his body and his shed blood, all of us now can come right in to the presence of the Lord. So we are the people of the way. Um, but you could also be called the people who call upon the name of the Lord. The people everywhere who call upon the name of the Lord. It was an identifying term of endearment that Paul uses when he says, I'm sending this letter to everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. Would you put up your hand if you call upon the name of the Lord? It is your habit and your place to call upon the name of the Lord. Great. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you today for your help as you train us and teach us in the purposes of the Lord. Father, we want to grow to be more like Jesus. And we want to shine this gospel to the world around us. And Lord, we want to know how to be wise to fight the battles that are necessary in the spiritual realm and to take hold of of our inheritance in Christ. We receive your blessings now. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> I mentioned in August that the month of September and October coming right up to the election would be a time of increased spiritual battles in the nation and in our lives individually. I have seen that to be so true. Even on my own life, I have felt more challenge and more difficulty over this month of September, which is just behind us, than I think I have perhaps in 10 years as a minister of the gospel. This is a time to guard your hearts. Uh, do you know that when you gossip, and speak ill of other members in the body of Christ, that it opens a door for demonic activity to come against them. Yeah. And when you only speak well and you bless, it, it really releases angelic anointing and angels to come and surround them. Angels love to be around the word of the Lord and the people who are full of the word of the Lord and the people who are overcomers and praise the Lord uh, all the time. Uh, demons run away from that. So guard yourselves. When I talk about spiritual warfare, I'm not only talking about you getting sick or having a flat tire. I'm talking about you guarding your heart at such a time as this. Because the Lord would love to destroy relationships and break us apart in every way that he can. And you know where this begins? It begins with pride in our own hearts. We might think it's a legitimate criticism, but actually it can be, it is a pride in our own heart. And that pride, actually if not curbed and dealt with, will actually produce a rebellious spirit in us. And a rebellious spirit, if let flourish, will produce witchcraft. Alright? So pride leads to rebellion, which leads to witchcraft. 
So I want to say these things to you because all of you have a spirit, a spiritual meter going on inside of you. You guard your hearts. Uh, I am not worried for myself in, in this time. I've been around the mountain and through the valley of the shadow of death on lots of occasions. And I am not going to move or be shaken or lose out in any way. Um, I just know my God. That's why. But I want to say to you to guard yourself that you don't get brought down and love one another fervently during this time and focus on those things that are encouraging and of goodness and blessings and strengthen one another. Well, that's really not my message, but it kind of goes in with spiritual warfare and I needed to say it right up front. So this spiritual time of spiritual warfare, if you're going to go to war in the military, you have to go to boot camp. And boot camp is a place where you get trained. You know, right here on the front row, we have a brother who was a Marine. And there's many who have served, about uh, 25 people have served in the military here in this congregation. So you know about boot camp where they get tough on you and they call you up and they, they uh, push you to the limit uh, and to get your exercise going, your muscles growing and get you wise to know what to do when you're in a combat situation. And we need some spiritual boot camp in the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that? We need that at this time because we need to know how to stand, having done all, to stand in the evil day. And while the, you know, our brother Chuck gave, come up and gave a, a prophetic word about the unveiling because there, there's a lot of evil and there, but there's a lot of accomplishment and good that's been taking place. It's really amazing both in the nation and in our physical lives. But some people, they just don't like conflict or battle or difficulty at all. Even if you win at the end, they don't like the process because they get beat up in it. Uh, but the process is unavoidable. The victory is what you need to look for. It's like uh, having a baby. You know, it's uh, from what I've seen. Uh, I don't have personal experience. Uh, but I was in the delivery room for all four babies. And, uh, you know, G.I. Joy, she's amazing when it comes to those things. Uh, but I know the travail. And, you know, as a pastor <clears throat> for all these years, there's been some uh, ladies who had uh, labor for 26 hours. Uh, yeah, until their, their eyes were all bloodshot and they were all swollen, you know, their faces and everything. And they were almost unrecognizable because of the pain and the difficulty that, that they went through. And finally, the baby came and they went back to normal, you know. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 the joy of having the baby was the focus. And it's amazing for all of you ladies that after a while you forget about all the difficulty and the travail of the delivery because of the joy. And the Bible talks about this, the joy of a child. And I want you to see the pride. I want you to see the glory of God and the victory of heaven in your life and in your family and in this nation, even though you have to go through some difficult battles along the way. Can you say amen? amen. So we need to be in a spiritual boot camp. And uh, some of you are in training. Uh, all of you are. But then there's training in the field. And you need to become wise in this so that you take on what you need to be a spiritual overcomer and a warrior. Don't just sit back and let the devil eat your lunch. You have to learn how to fight and how to be strong. And I want you to know that you do have a secret weapon that will send the devil running every time. It's the name of Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 verses 9 to 10 tell us about this name of Jesus. We read there, Philippians 2 verse 9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ 
is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So he's given him a name that is above every other name. You need to know that the name of Jesus, there is nothing like it in the whole world. There's no authority, there is no strength, there's no power that is stronger than the name of Jesus. I remember when I was just a young preacher and uh, one of the times when I learned the power of Jesus. I was still a teenager and I was asked to be an associate assistant pastor for this huge old church building in downtown Toronto. And I lived in the suburbs and it was an hour to go from there to the church. But they asked me if I'd be the assistant pastor. I was 18. And uh, it was quite a, a situation because downtown Toronto, like in a lot of big cities, there was a lot of people with big problems. And they would come into this church um, way down in, in the downtown area. And you have to picture one of these old cathedral like churches, stone churches with big spires and all pews. And, and that church uh, sat more than this church. And uh, people would come in there. And many of them were not Christians at all. They would just be walking along the streets and they would come into the church because the doors were open and they heard the music. And I remember getting up to preach and it was one of those where you had to go up steps and steps and steps and, and then there's big wooden pulpits. And, and so I'm preaching and all of a sudden this man full of demon spirits who had come in jumps up on one of these pews and he starts walking from the front to the back on the back of the pew. You know where the, where the back is? And he was just walking, walking, and he walking all the way up. And a couple of the ushers sat him down when he got to the front, and he sat there biting his nails, and eyes were red, and he was looking at me while I was preaching the Word of God. And afterwards I said, who would like to come and give their life to Jesus? Well, a whole pile of people came, and he came. And he sat there on the front. He didn't kneel down. He just sat there and uh, he was looking out. And I went and I sat beside him. And uh, I just came and I sat beside him like this. And I said, it's time that you gave your life to Jesus. And he looked at me and he showed his teeth. And he started to snarl like an animal. And he put his fist in my face. And he said, you know, right now I could punch you right in the face. And I said, no, you can't. In the name of Jesus, I take authority over you. And I refuse to let you do that. And he jumped up and screamed and ran across the front of the church and dove underneath the grand, the baby grand piano that was there. He dove underneath and shook like a scared rat in the corner. Of course, I pulled him out and cast some demons out and prayed over him. But I remember at that moment when I said, no, you can't. In the name of Jesus, and immediately the authority of heaven came onto the situation. I want you to know that there is power for you in the name of Jesus. You need to learn this. If you have not learned yet the name of Jesus and the power, then you need to. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us about our need to get saved. You know, a lot of people will talk about God in a general term. But when it comes to salvation, you have to go through Jesus. And we read about that in Acts chapter 4. It says in verse 12, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name. Say no other name. no other name. There is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And this is the name that actually can take somebody from the kingdom of darkness and demons and torment and abuse and in the name of Jesus instantaneously bring them through into another kingdom, pull the curtains back and have the glory of God shine in them, bring healing to their heart and give them a new beginning in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know, Joy's mom and dad were typical traditional church people, but they were not really disciples of Christ. They hadn't given their lives to the Lord. In fact, when 
Joy came and heard me preaching when she was a teenager and we had an altar call and she came and gave her life to Jesus because I said, Lord, I really want to marry that lady so she's got to get saved. And uh, God put it all together. But she said she'd been going to, to a church all of her life but she had never given her life to Jesus. And when I started to visit Joy's mom and dad, they did not like it. I mean, they thought I was a nice guy, but my goodness, I was this fanatic, you know. And I was a youth pastor and uh, in a Holy Spirit church, and they did not like this. And I found, you know, once we started talking, that I could say God in the home, but I could not say Jesus. As soon as I mentioned Jesus, they got all squirmy and wiggly and left the room. And there is power in the name of Jesus. And there is no other name under heaven whereby a man or a woman can be saved except through that name. And Joy and I got married three years later. And it was some time after that, I don't know, two or three years after that, when uh, Joy's dad became a Christian. And his mother came, became a Christian the year we got married. And we prayed and, and were bold but sweet and kind of like good dark chocolate. And uh, mom got saved and then dad, he went away to help his brother rebuild a cottage up in the northern part of Canada that had burned down in a forest fire. And when he came back, he had been gone for a couple of months all summer. He sat in the kitchen with me and the ladies and uh, Joy's mom and and Joy, and finally at midnight, they decided to go to bed. And Joy's dad, he was talking away. And I was not like him. He never talked. But now he couldn't stop talking. And finally, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, he said, Peter, I want to tell you what happened. He said, I was up on the roof of the cottage and starting to do some work up there. And I stood up because my back, he was in his 60s. He said, I stood up because my back was sore. And the wind came off the lake and hit me in the chest. And I fell off the back of the roof, two stories up, rocks below, and his foot got caught in the eaves trough and he hung upside down by the eaves trough up on the roof. And he said, my brother ran up inside and reached through the opening where the window was going to go and pulled me in and saved my life. And I said, Dad, do you know who saved your life? And he started to get tears in his eyes. And he said, yeah, it was the man upstairs. <laughs> I said, yeah, and his name's Jesus. I said, can you say Jesus? And he could hardly talk. Now he started crying. And I said, it's time, Dad. It's time for you to give your life to Jesus. And he, I led him through a sinner's prayer. And he cried like a little baby. And he gave his life to Jesus. And instantaneously, this man who was frozen in his spirit, who didn't know how to really enjoy life or to walk in a place of fulfillment, all of a sudden was washed clean by the blood of the Lamb and came into the family of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. There is salvation in no other name. And don't think that, that there is somebody beyond the reach of the name of Jesus. You take the name of Jesus and let that be your life. Everything you do, let it be in the name of Jesus. Now, the next thing I want to talk to you about is ministry. Because once you get saved, how many here are saved? Just wave at me. You're saved, which means you've given your life to Jesus. Good. Well, if you didn't lift your hand, I'll be happy to pray with you after the service. You may cry. You should. If God touches your life, I don't know how you can have God of creation touch your life and it not be somewhat of an emotional experience. Because he's God and you're a human being. You should expect it. We don't, we don't believe in emotions for the sake of fanaticism or to stir something up. But when God comes... Oh my goodness. You're overwhelmed with his presence and his power and his love and his goodness. So once you become a Christian, 
then you have to have some discipleship in your life and then you have to become a minister all right I'm gonna ask you lift your hand up today this is show and tell how many of you see yourself as a minister of Jesus Christ put your hand up please all right I'll put them down all right now if you didn't lay, lift your hand up it's okay but I'm just telling you it's for you too all right because every one of you is called to be a minister in some way a minister of prayer a minister I'm not saying you have to preach up here uh, but to tell somebody to witness uh, to pray for somebody to speak a word of life to somebody else to help somebody to be a minister to care for other people this is your assignments and your place and so every one of us is called to be a minister now when we go into the book of Mark we find what all believers are supposed to do in the ministry and um, this isn't popular in every church but it is in Jesus church because he's saying this and so we go to Mark chapter 16 and we read there in Mark 16 verse 17 it says and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name they will drive out demons this isn't somebody who's gone to Bible school for four years this is somebody who believes and of course if they go to Bible school they'll hopefully become more knowledgeable in the word but that hopefully doesn't cause them to clam up but to be released all the more and these signs accompany those who believe in my name they will drive out demons they will speak in new tongues they will pick up snakes in their hands and drink deadly poison it will not harm them now, that doesn't mean you should go around picking up snakes or drinking deadly poison it just means that you know if these kind of things happen to you God's gonna protect you there's a protection here it will not hurt them at all they and they will lay their hands on sick people and they will get better they will recover so this is the ministry of all believers and it's it is your ministry so when we go to the book of John we read about that kind of ministry and I'm gonna just look at a verse or so from John 14 15 and 16 notice I'm giving you a lot of verses here so that this is founded on the Word of God and not just my own ideas this is not a a denominational thing or a certain a thing for a certain church this is for anybody who believes in the Bible and so we read there in John chapter 14 and verse 13 it says and I will do whatever you ask in my name say in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father you may ask for anything in my name say in my name again I want to get this into your brains in the name of Jesus and I will do it for you and then we go to the next chapter chapter 15 of John and we read in verse 16 it says if uh, you did not choose me but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit fruit that will last then the Father will give you whatever you ask say it with me in my name now go to the next chapter in John chapter 16 and verse 23 and there we read in that day you will no longer ask me anything I tell you the truth my father will give you whatever you ask in my name for anything in my name ask and you will receive and that your joy may be complete so the ministry of prayer over people and for people and for the nation should always be done in the name of Jesus because there's power in the name of Jesus so first of all there's no other name whereby you can be saved except through the name of Jesus right and when the name of Jesus comes into a person's life and they believe on his name then they are going to be transformed inside and out now they're going to have to go through a, a lifetime of discipling and and yielding to the Lord so that they'll continually change to be more like him but then you're called to be a minister you don't have to wait until you're being a Christian for a lot of years before you start to minister as a matter of fact you should minister right away as soon as you become a Christian go and pray for somebody else because you know it's not your own smarts that is what is important nor is it your own charisma or your good looks 
or something like that, your favorability. It's none of that. It has to do with the power in the name of Jesus. And as soon as you submit to the Lord and give your life to Jesus, then you will receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then the words that come out of your mouth in the name of Jesus will have power and authority continuously. And so it's most fun to watch a new Christian in the ministry. I think it's one of the joys of every pastor or church worker is to see somebody get saved, just r miraculously converted, get cleaned up, and then start to minister to other people. And they're actually sometimes the best evangelists because they can't, they can hardly believe the change that's taken place. And uh, if you're married to somebody, they will see the change. That we just stayed with a couple who had this experience where she was saved for many years and he would never go to church. And when we were down in Miami, we stayed in their home. And then it was some time later when uh, he just stepped out. He met somebody who witnessed to him and invited him to church. And he, he went to his wife and he says, a friend of mine just asked me to go to church. Will you come? She was so excited. And they went and he got saved that day and he never left that church. He's still in that church today, 10 years later. Yeah. So, but now he's a minister of the gospel and a great businessman there in Miami. So this is the call of God on your life. Three nights ago, I was preaching in a different church uh, besides the one that we went down to Miami, you know, Pastor Raul Molina, I have to speak you know, with an interpreter there. And, you know, they're speaking in Spanish, of course. They're all mostly Cuban, but from all over uh, South and Central America. And so I'm preaching there on the signs of the times and um, on Jesus, the light of the world and other subjects. And then um, I was invited to go to this church called Rise Up Church. And it meets in the Presbyterian church, a church building. And so I went there to preach, and the pastor said, would you please preach on breaking generational curses? And I said, yes, we'd love to do that. And they never had anybody speak to them on this subject. And somehow he got a hold of my book and said, we need this. So I went there, and, <coughs> and the place was pretty packed. Uh, and at the end of preaching, going through the scriptures, I invite the people up. So the, the people stretch from one side to the other, Oh, and then there was a couple of rows, and so I started to go down and pray over people and break curses off in the name of Jesus and lead people to salvation. And one of the ministries that really, I mean, lots of people were crying and, and receiving uh, all kinds of healing and deliverance. And I came to this one lady, and she was probably 40 years of age. And what I said to her, I hadn't said to anybody else. I just came up to her and was responding under what the Holy Spirit gave me. I put my hand on her and said, you spirit of murder, get out of her. She buckled over and started to bring up. And demons started to come out with screams and screeches. And uh, you know, people who hadn't seen this before in the church were kind of spooked. Uh, you know, like, whoa. And they all started speaking in tongues and getting on their knees and, you know, getting into prayer. Uh, but this is quite normal. It happened all the time with Jesus. And, and for maybe five minutes, just I prayed with her. And she had some powerful, powerful deliverance. And God cleaned her up and just drove these things out of her life. And afterwards, she said, she came up to me when, when the meeting was over. She said, how did you know? And uh, I said, pardon? She said, how did you know that my son was in prison right now for murder? Because he's committed murder. And, uh, and that's not the only murder that I saw when I went to break the spirit. Uh, but it, it was a, a generational thing. And so um, <clears throat> she was ministered to. This is not extraordinary. This is just normal. You say it's not normal in my church, if you go to a different church. Well, I wish it was. Uh, because it was normal for Jesus. And we work for him. And you don't need to be frightened of these things in any way. You just need to be strong in the Lord. And so, <clears throat> uh, ministry comes with power in the name 
of Jesus. Now, we need to do a ministry checkup uh, before we go any further. Because, you know, there's a lot of people who have given their lives to God, and then, for some reason or another, they, they take their life off the altar. You know what I'm talking about? They still go back to their old sins. And, but, when they're in church circles or whatever, they use the name of Jesus all the time. And there's something wrong. And actually, other people know. It's kind of like bad breath. You know, you don't, you don't know you got it, but everybody else does. Yeah, and uh, so, this is what the Lord says about that. In, Mark, uh, in Matthew chapter 7, I'm going to tell you that just because you say the name of Jesus doesn't make everything right. So in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22, we read, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in, in your name? Say in your name. And in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Remember what I talked to you about at the beginning? Watch out for pride. Everybody's got it. Everybody. I, I um, have this experience when I, for, for five years in my life, God spoke to me through picking up dimes. And every single day I picked up a dime. And every time the Lord gave me this word in my heart that said, I am with you. It's a long story, but it was a prophecy that was given to me. Somebody picked up a dime and said, this is for you. And it's a sign that God will be with you and will bless you. And then every day for five years, I found a dime. Even when I was in Israel or Canada, <clears throat> I would find a dime. And after five years, it stopped. And the Lord said, the season of the dimes are over. And that was the week we started this church. And I didn't need the dimes. I have lots of prophets around me now for encouragement. But that was a special time. But about halfway through it, um, I was walking through a parking lot. And there was, I saw something glistening. And I thought it was a dime. And when I got close to it, I saw oh, it was just a penny. And I, I don't pick up pennies. I'm too proud to pick up pennies. And the Lord said to me, pick it up. And I thought, what if somebody sees me picking up a penny? It's not a good testimony, Lord. And the Lord said, pick it up. Because it's a sign of humility and you need it. And uh, I said, but pennies are everywhere. And the Lord said, yes, they are. And you should pick them up. It's not because I want the pennies, but because the Lord works on something inside of me. So now, I don't see dimes. I just see pennies. And every time I see one, I pray. And I say, Lord, help me. Help me to be a humble man. This is not about me. It's about you and your kingdom and your people and your purpose on the earth. So I need help. And so the Lord gives me lots of help because he shows me lots of pennies. Yeah. So just because you say the name of Jesus and you attend church doesn't mean everything is a-okay. I am not your judge, nor am I a policeman. But I am your counselor, your pastor, and the one who has to help you be trained in this spiritual warfare time. So you have to have integrity and you've got to be humble and you mustn't be self-focused or selfishly ambitious because that's pride and if it's allowed to stay, it will actually bring rebellion. A lot of people leave churches all the time and not all of them do it for the same reason, but some do it because of rebellion and because they didn't deal with the pride thing inside of them. And they're looking for something that maybe the pastor can't give them. And because of that, pride rises and rebellion. If that is allowed to fester and stay, please hear me, it produces witchcraft. And witchcraft is when you manipulate 
other people with spiritual powers. And even in the church, anywhere around the world, there can be elements of witchcraft in the way the people handle each other. So, we found that in the name of Jesus, there is salvation, there is ministry, but we need to check the ministry, keep ourselves humble, and keep ourselves dependent on the Lord and not on ourselves. And I'm going to close um, by saying a few other things. <clears throat> I want to talk to you now about warfare and the name of Jesus as we bring this to a close. Because there are times when it feels like you are all alone and everything is against you. It comes from every direction and you don't feel that you have the strength for it. There are times when every one of us will be tempted to the core in one way or another. Just over this week, Billy Scott and we're going to pray for him at the end of the service. But he was taken into hospital. And we were on our way to a mission down in Miami. I got the phone call from Dot, his wife. And we prayed over the phone. And she was very grateful. And he had an amazing turn for the better. And then <clears throat> Friday night, we had driven 11 hours from Miami. And we just got in the door. And we got a phone call from Billy Scott's uh, daughter. And you know, they're, Billy and Dot are in their 80s. And she said, please, Pastor, Billy's in the hospital, and he is shaking. He has a fever. Uh, we can't get through to him. He is in a severe, desperate situation. So immediately, I prayed over the phone, and then Joy and I uh, got changed and went to the hospital uh, in the evening. And to lay hands and pray over him. And in the name of Jesus, we went into that room. And in the name of Jesus, we put our hands on him. And we spoke the words of life in the name of Jesus. And we cursed the sickness and the infection. And then all these nurses started coming in. They took him out. Uh, they thought he had septicemia. They discovered he didn't have that. And that he had, but they, they did then a CAT scan and found that there is uh, some blood clot. But all of a sudden he started to turn for the better from that moment. And they're now giving him something to dissolve. They, in fact, what Chuck talked about, the uncovering and unveiling of the problem, was unveiled. And now they're giving him something to, to uh, dissolve those, those clots. And so uh, he has taken an amazing turn for the better. Uh, I believe, with the help of the doctors, but mostly because of the name of Jesus. <clears throat> I remember when I got beat up real bad as a pastor. I told my kids, don't become a pastor. Unless you can't help yourself. Especially if you have a larger church, there's always somebody who's speaking negatively. And sometimes the devil just uses good Christian people uh, to just bring a whole train of accusation against you. And then, then demons seem to have a right to attack. And it comes everywhere. And I can remember being, and this is a long time ago, I was under that kind of attack. I'm talking more than 30 years ago. And we were just newly married. We'd been married 43 years. And I remember coming in the house, I could hardly talk. In fact, this, this demonic attack against me was so strong, I could hardly walk. And I couldn't think. And I couldn't pray. And I remember going down into the basement where we had a rec room, and there was a carpet there. And I just laid, I closed the door, and I just laid on that carpet. I threw a blanket over me and I was kind of laid in a fetal position and all I could do was say Jesus. That's all I could do. I said Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I fell asleep saying the name of Jesus. I want to say this to you 
Because there may be a time when you have to do this. And when I woke up, this whole thing had left. And I was still saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I remember Joy's mom. She had been a Christian, a wonderful woman of God now since we got married. But it was many years later, because the Lord told her she was going to live for another 20 years from that time. And it was getting to the end of that 20-year period. And um, she had a stroke. She went into the hospital. And she was a very happy lady, full of peace. And I went and sat on the side of her bed. And I took her hand. And she had a spirit of depression on her. And I said, Mom, you're having a real hard time, aren't you? She said, yes, I am, Peter. I said, it's because you can't pray, right? Because she used to be such a woman of prayer. But she couldn't get her brains and her thoughts together. And I said, it's okay, Mom. Can you say Jesus? She just nodded. I said, let me hear it. Through, you know, shaking lips. Very feeble. She said, Jesus. I said, that's it, Mom. Say it again. Jesus. I said, you keep saying that. And the power of the Holy Spirit just filled the room. Just filled the room. She began to cry. She felt the presence of God again and the goodness of the Lord. This is what the Bible says. Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's His name. There's authority and power in His name. I just, I want you to do this. Put your hand, hands together like this in front of you. I want you to Open up the shopping bag. Okay. It's the name of Jesus, all right? This is, this is your inheritance and your blessing and your strength to be a warrior and a strong man and a strong woman of God in any situation, at any time, in any place, anywhere in the world. You are those who call upon the name of Jesus. And you will have the victory. I speak it over you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet? All right. I'm just going to pray for you. And then those of you who would like added prayer, we're going to call the ministry team up to the front here. You please come and get prayer, more prayer if you need it. But right now, just hold your hands like this and pray this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, Thank you for saving me. Today I give you everything. Forgive me of my sins. And fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for washing me with the blood of Jesus. And removing all my sins. And giving me his name. Because I am his child. And in the name of Jesus. Every enemy shall go. I have power and authority in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I ask now that you would teach me not to rely on my own strength. For my strength is in the Lord who made heaven and earth. Therefore, I will not be moved. And in the name of Jesus... I will bring forth much fruit. I receive blessings on my life because of the name of Jesus. And I will be an overcomer because of the name of Jesus. I give you thanks, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. The ministry team, please come. Now put your hand on your heart. And I'm going to pray and bless you now. In the name of Jesus, I bless you. With the blessings promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I speak strength over you. I come against every curse and every act of witchcraft, every criticism and gossip against you. I break its power. 
I break every intentional plan of the enemy against your life. And I speak strength to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. I speak blessings on you, on your marriage, on your children, and on your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I speak the joy of the Lord into your heart and the peace of God in your home. And I release God's favor and goodness over your life. I speak it now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. 